So, uh, Adam took me out of my car and said, I don't think fire has anything to do with fertility, so we'll try and try and So, we'll talk about science and engineering and reasoning. Unfortunately, politics, I'm not going to talk about politics. It's a very hard thing with NBN not to talk about politics, but I'll do my best right through. So, again, from the basketball coaching days, in a timeout, which is this is about the same time you get as a timeout to talk to you today, you only ever talk about three things. So we'll go through a little bit of basics on fibre, because a lot of talk is about fibre, and then I'll tell you about three different myths. So we'll uh, we'll get stuck into that sort of thing to go through. So the the why do we have fibre? Why do you use fibre? Fibre doesn't degrade. Fibre is glass, it's silicon, it goes in the ground, it doesn't rust, it doesn't corrode. It is a very, very long-lasting product. How does it work? Everybody's stuck a straw in a glass and seen the straw bend. The straw doesn't bend, light bends. Light normally goes in a straight line, so how do you put light down a fiber that goes in the ground. You put it down the core of the fiber. So a fiber is made up of a core, some cladding, and then around the outside of that a coating, so you can actually tell which fiber's which. And again, the old copper color code that used to last, green or blue, orange, green, brown slate, and various things that the people from the PMG days might remember, they actually use the same color code on the fiber itself. So that's the sort of thing that makes up a fibre. Now, how does the light work in there? If this piece of rod was that core of the fibre, and you put a light down, and a light from a laser pointer goes in a straight line, and you can see that light going in a straight line down the fibre, but as it reaches the interface between the core and the outside, you'll see a refractive index and the light bends. So the light actually bends in the core of the fiber. So that's how an optical fiber works. It actually sends the light down the fiber and the light stays in the core of that fiber. Now, one of the most important things about fiber is knowing what it looks like. See, over the years, in many presentations, people have a different image in their mind about what a fiber actually is. How big is this thing? So, a fibre that you would have going into your house would be one of these. So that's a single fibre cable, a drop cable that goes into a house. Now, why is it that big? It's that big, big because there's two strength members, there's two Kevlar strength members in there. So if you open it up... Excuse me, yep. can you pull it up against the white background? That's the fibre in the middle. So the two strength members, and then that's the fibre. So that's the optical fibre. That's the thing. That's the thing that would connect your premise, your house, to the internet. That fibre in the middle. Now it's glass. So I'll send it around. Is there any occupational health and safety people here? <laughs> Please don't touch the fibre. It's glass. It's sharp and it will go into your finger. So I'll send it around so you can have a look at it. And there's a few more here that I've prepared earlier as well. So that's another piece of the core. These two are 12 fibres. There's actually 12 fibres in the ribbons that are there. So there to go around and have a look at. So again, don't touch the fibre. This is a piece of cladding itself. And again, if you wanted a fairly large one, this is a 432 fibre cable. So that's 432 fibres in there at a ribbon configuration. That's the sort of fibre we were putting in or designing to put in an NBN. This particular fibre cable has a stainless steel wrapper around it. We're using these in India because the rats ate the cable. So it's rodent proof, it blunts their teeth. So you can see the fibres at the end of it, and the and again, is it flexible? Yeah, you can tie it in a knot. It's bending sensitive fibre in this, so it's a flexible cable. I don't suppose. <laughs> and here again, there's a couple of samples of other size cables. 
that are ribbon cables. Ribbon means there's 12 fibres stuck together in a flat ribbon. So again, the blue one, don't look at that too much, that's a Tolstra cable, so it's a strand of one. But, uh, the green ones are NBN. We were, we're very green in NBN. So we had green cable. So that's the cable. So fibre is important. That's what it looks like. We talk a lot about fibre. When these go around, you'll know what they actually look like itself. So the first myth that comes out Australia is too large and diverse for fibre. It's too big a place. We can't afford to put fibre in Australia. So again, 75% of the premises in Australia take up less than 0.5% of the land area. And if you go up to 90%, that's in less than 3% of the land area. So yes, Australia is a very large place. That's why we had the last 7% covered by wireless and satellite. And fibre covered 90%. Now again, there were many, many debates about that. 93% that the politicians talked about. I reckon we could get about 92, but that last percent is very interesting. But we actually designed, my, my job was planning and design. People used to say I was hoping and dreaming, but it, was, it wasn't that at all. It wasn't hoping and dreaming, it was planning and design. So we actually did things mathematically. We had a group of Australian mathematics, operational mathematics, Viari their name was the company. This company designed the routes for delivering Coke bottles, so the Coke deliveries, for getting trains of iron ore to the, where, to the ships when the ships were there and the mines were producing. They did the maths for scheduling. And when we talked to them, their mathematicians did the maths for every premises in Australia. Not a sample, not a model, not a design, but the data we had for every address in Australia, we designed how it would connect on fibre. And we got a graph that looked like that. So this is the zero, and this is as it goes up to 90, that's 100%. You never get to 100%, not on a graph with those axes. So you can see it's fairly linear along the front. But again, because it's science, I can actually talk today about the second derivative of that, which is the slope of the line. So if you look at the cost of each incremental premises, you can see out here it's very, very, very linear until it gets around here. So when you start talking about 90%, from an engineering perspective, it got pretty hairy. Because it's very, very expensive to get those next houses. But if you're having a debate about should you connect 80% of the fibre, not much of a discussion whether you want to connect 24% that they're talking about now, or 80, it's not really much difference. So that's how much do the premises actually cost. And it's very similar, because if you go out to the back of Gilgandra, a block of land in Gilgandra is not much different in size to a block in Penrith. So the size of the land blocks, the size of the job to connect the houses in fibre, doesn't matter whether you're in Penrith or Gill, same place. So, we then said, why isn't the cost in Australia coming down? The so strategic review that occurred for the next 10 years that they modelled it had no change in the cost of fibre. So here, this is Verizon in the US. Why is Verizon up there? Verizon started putting in a product called Fios, which is fibre over there, very, very early. They were one of the earliest people to run out fibre to the home. And it came down in cost over the years. Six years, that's what it came down to. That's what they're targeting in 2015. So that's what they're doing in the US with cost. In New Zealand, Chorus in New Zealand, they started at 4,753, now down to just over three, just under three grand. So their costs are coming down. In India, we had $357 per premise and they said it was too expensive. It's got to be cheaper. Mind you, you're only paying somebody a dollar a day as labour costs, so that's where they're so cheap over in India. NBN Co, what were our initial costs? 
In Tasmania, the first ones that were done in Tasmania were nearly $5,000 per premises. The stage two was four. The first release sites, the five sites that were built as a trial site, a test site, virtually handcrafted and hand done, they were 3,100. The next type one services, 1,800, the type two, 1,200. So again, our plan was to get that down to 1,200 per premises. What's the current stated cost for putting in fibre to the premises? 2,264 for greenfield, so new developments, places where the pit and pipe is built as part of the development, and NBNCO just puts in all of the fibre infrastructure and brownfields, which is existing copper served Telstra premises, 4392. It's gone up. Why has it gone up? Well, if the owner of the company says the fibre costs more, I don't think people get sacked for making fibre costs more. Let's not dwell on that. So the fibre's gone up. So that's what's happened. Okay. What could have happened? So changes that were happening before the multi-technology mix was proposed. There was a new architecture, about 20% reduction in cost. Step change, which was a change to the way we interacted with Telstra for the work that was done to make the duct infrastructure suitable to put the fiber in. It was going to come down by, say, 7 to 12. Melton project, which was a site in Melbourne, and a product called Render, which was a mechanism to schedule work that was designed by those same BRE mathematicians that did the work before, that pulled the cost down by 35%. Not estimated, real. That's what happened when they built it. New technology introduction of various things, again, another 10%. All of these things would have reduced the price of fiber. But we're not building any more fiber. So, why should you build fiber? You should build fiber because it's much, much cheaper to maintain. Besides giving you a much better infrastructure for the future, it's cheaper. Faults per hundred services is less than one fault per hundred services per year. Average copper price, or average copper fault rate is about 14 faults per hundred services per year. These Bell and Bell Atlant, Verizon, they reckon 103 per premise reduction, HBC 93. This estimate is the cost for Australia, 52 in Australian dollars. So these are things that make it cheaper to maintain a network that's built on fibre. But even if you didn't, even if you said fibre costs 4,400, is it better? Should you do it? The answer is yes, because here, <coughs> this time here, you've got this particular line that sits there as a profitability of a fibre to the node infrastructure, and that's the profitability of the fibre to the premises. So after just six years, you make more money out of a fibre to the premises solution. Just six years. That's how long it takes. Okay. So that's that particular myth. The next one is building a better broadband across Australia. So the original NBNCO was a utility. So I, I sort of trained for 45 years. I started out as a linesman, sitting in a hole in the ground, joining paper and insulated lead sheet copper cables. Ended up designing a fibre network to replace the copper infrastructure for the country. That was my job. I wasn't designing a network to deliver broadband to residents. That wasn't what I was doing. I was replacing the copper network for all of Australia with fiber. 93% of it anyway. So that was my job. So again, it was for residential, business and enterprise and industrial for 30 to 50 years. That was the job. That's what we were doing. How are we doing it? We're doing it by having a series of modules by actually building fibre out in a modular structure. So we had a fibre serving area around a fibre access node, or an exchange. So an exchange area, 
say Springwood up here, Springwood we've done from Glenbrook up the mountains a little way further. So again, in one particular area, there's a fibre serving area with modules, these fibre serving area modules. And again, each one of them stepped up, so you had about 38,000 services within that fibre serving area. That was the modular design, about 15k of distance. In this particular modules, where you had a street, you had duct work in that street. So the duct, generally down one side of the street, set up with ducts across the street, pit on either side. So again, a modular structure. I allocated two fibres to each block, to each lot. People said, we mad, why do you want two fibres? I only need one, why do you put two in? How many houses have you seen turn into a duplex? If you want to put one fiber in there, where the hell are they going to get another one from? So I allocated two. And then I said, even with the two, I'll put a tube. I'll put 12 fibers for four premises. Works out to be one pit anyway, so a pit that's there. So I'll drop a tube off in each pit. Because you've got bus stops, you've got security cameras, you've got traffic lights. I don't know where they all are, so I'll put extra fiber in there for it. So I'll allocate 12 fibers for four houses. People say, you're mad. Why would you do that? That's three fibers per house. No, it's not. It's two fibers per lot and four spares for the future. Because we're putting in fiber for the next 50 to 100 years, not just for now. That was the plan. So that's what we're doing. So, down each street itself, we put in a cabinet, so a fibre distribution hub. Fibre distribution hub does about 280 odd premises. The access, whoops, the access joint itself is here. So a cable comes from out to that access joint, they look like that. And then you come back to multi-ports, these units here, where you actually plug in a drop cable. And it's all plug and play. You splice here, you splice there, all of the rest of it is plugged in when it's needed. So if I only have four houses, I put a four-port multi-port in. If I put in a duplex, I unplug that, plug in a six-port. If I want two duplexes or three or four, I unplug it, plug another one in, because they're all there ready. The cabinet is all ready for it. All I do is run patch cords in the cabinet. That's what you do. So. Again, from the fan site out to each one of those cabinets, we ran a 288 fibre cable out there and a 432 fibre cable out to that joint and that joint. Now, you might say, goodness me, why 288 fibres and 432? Cost you around about $80 a metre to put fibre in an underground solution. For a 288 fibre cable, it costs about $1.32 a metre. For a 432, it costs you about $3. So less than 5% of the cost of putting the cable in the ground is the actual fibre. So when, you, when you're digging a hole, you better put the biggest cable in you want it because it's going to be there for the future. So the network itself was a passive network, a passive optical network. What did that mean? There's electronics in the exchange, down here in the fan sites, and each person's house. The rest of it is passive. All done with mirrors, or spectrum, or splitters, but it's not electronic. Why is that important? It's not important because that's what most pits look like. It's a bucket of water in front. It's full of mud. Now, fibre to the curb that's being talked about now is taking fibre all the way to the pit out in front of your house and then they're putting some active electronics in the pit that you power from your house, and it's going to survive for how long again? Anyway, let's not draw. <laughs> again, this particular relocation of a fan site occurred, it's still working. Why does it work? Because it's passive. There's no batteries in there, there's no electronics in there. It uncoiled the cable when it got hit by the car, and it still worked. Not a problem. I've seen a fibre distribution hub hosed out with a fire hose because it's full of mud after a flood. Still working. Gas type seals all plugged together. Not a problem because it's passive. Hit a node with a semi and see how long it's going to work for. 
not long. Not long. So that's the second myth. We're building fiber just for broadband. The next one is the myth of the mobile network. You've got to remember this one. There's going to be questions later, so you've got to remember this particular one. This is very important to me. Even Paul O'Sullivan, the CEO of Optus at the time, couldn't get his head around the fact that there is no mobile network. You hear people talk about it all the time. What does your phone connect to? They, it's not a mobile network. It's a fixed wireless network. The towers don't move, they haven't got legs, they're not on wheels. You see them, you look around there, they're on top of big buildings, and they're not moving. So is a network moving? No, network doesn't move. What moves? People move, devices move. People want mobility. Yeah, great, not a problem. That's what everybody's using, but that's not the network, that's the devices. Mobile services on mobile devices. That's what people want. But again, where does your Wi-Fi come from? It comes from your gateway in your house. And how is your gateway connected? It's got to be connected these days by a fixed connection. And again, you look at 5G. Everybody's saying 5G is what's going to happen. What about this? What about this new radio stuff called 5G, pretty flash? You look at it there, 1G was analog voice, 2G is digital voice, 3G is mobile broadband, 4G is mobile internet, so it's getting there. Again, remember, these are services, not networks. 5G, what's it all about? It's about three things. And like everything that's happening in the technology space, there are three things that almost have mutually exclusive design parameters. One of them is enhanced broadband, one gigabit download speeds. Wow. The next one is mission critical services, low latency, sub single millisecond latency for accident prevention, drones, robotics, you know, autonomous vehicles. And then the third thing is the massive internet of things, very low, low bandwidth, slow, your fridge talking about restocking the milk. So again, three things. Pretty hard to design for all of those three things all at once, but yep, that's what 5G is all about. But is 5G going to replace your fixed network? Probably going to struggle a bit with that. So, what are you going to have to have to have 5G coverage? You're going to have to have a hell of a lot more towers. Because you only get about 200 concurrent services per cell site. So, where you're used to seeing poles and traffic lights and big antennas, they're going to be much smaller, but they're going to be a lot more of them. So now we've got about 16,000 4G cell sites. How many are we going to need? Probably about 380,000, roughly. So it's very, very different. And even when you're building all of that, even when all these people tell you that don't worry about fibre, fibre's dead, the radio is going to fix it, 5G is what it's all about. It's a matter of spectrum. It's about the matter of carriage. Technology is wonderful. You can code things, you can put new coding systems in place, you can put new electronic systems in place, but you've still got some fundamental things to come down to it. If you like, it's like the highway, it's the road your car drives on. You may have very, very different cars, you may have buses, you may have semis, you may have minis, you may have all different sorts of things, but you're driving on a road, and that road is spectrum. So if you said that you took all of the radio sort of spectrum, generally they talk about 700 meg or 1200 meg or 2.4 gig, so if we bundle all that up and said, okay, let's take 5 gig and say that's the spectrum for radio. What have you got for light? You've got 160 terahertz. What does that sort of mean? What it means is if radio is a one lane road, then a fiber is a 30,000 lane road. One fiber, that fiber that you saw going around, that's what it can carry. That's the difference. That's why we should have built fiber for the future. <laughs> Questions?
Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Our uh, photographer has our first question. <laughs> Thank you for that, Peter. Um, are we a bit late with it, is really my point, because I've, in my own home I use 4GX or 4G+, plus because I still don't have the NVN, still on the XL2+. Plus. And now with 5G being around the corner, has it been worthwhile ripping up everywhere when we're, is it not wiser to just build more towers instead of focus on wireless? What's, what's your stance on that? So the, the, one, of the, one of the core things about that, again, is ripping up everything and building an infrastructure there. The deal with Telstra was to utilise existing infrastructure. It was an $11 billion deal that was signed with Telstra to use it was 160,000 kilometres of their duct. Now, that duct, they had to make it fit. So it was a take or pay arrangement. NBNCO, we said we would use 160,000 kilometres of their duct, but they had to make it fit for us. If they could only make 130,000, so if they were 30,000 kilometres of duct short, we'd only then pay for 110,000. So there was a penalty to it. So they had to make it fit, because remember, NBNCO doesn't own that duct, they rent it. Telstra's getting a, an income for all of that duct with every fibre cable in it for many years. And now with the multi-technology mix, they bought the copper cable, so the operational cost that Telstra had to maintain the copper cable is now across on MBN codes back, but the ducts are still rented. So they bought the cable, they didn't buy the duct, they just bought the cable. Telstra still owns the duct, Telstra's will get paid rental on it. So you've got old decaying copper network in ducts that Tulsa are still being paid for. So go back to your comment about the towers. In your home, you may have your, uh, your, you may have an iPad, you may have a camera, you may have lots of things connected on Wi-Fi and radios because you like mobility. But your widescreen TV and your server and your backup servers might have a fixed connection to get the reliability and the high bandwidth to it. And again, to that particular point, you will have a fixed connection into your home. So those 380,000 cell sites have to have backhaul. They have to be connected via fiber. They have to have backhaul to go back to the network. People talk about cloud storage. You don't have to have any of your own personal storage or personal compute equipment. But you need connectivity. If you haven't got connectivity, you have major problems. And so that's why you need the connectivity. In your house, you may not have a single fixed tethered connection, but you would need a 5G radio transmitter in your house. So at the moment, Telstra is starting to get people used to this concept. Who, who has a Telstra modem with Telstra Air? Yeah. So what that means is that Telstra is letting their customers use the fixed connection to your house if they happen to be in your vicinity. So if they're close, they'll use your Wi-Fi. Now all Wi-Fi is is another radio. So 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, they're just radios. Your mobile device, your tablet, your phone, is a portable device, which is just radio. Now, why is 5G important to the carriers? At the moment, they really, really, really don't like it when you're on their network and then you switch across to somebody else's. <coughs> and if you go from Wi-Fi in your house and you've got a session open on your phone and you walk out and you go off your Wi-Fi, that session will drop out and you'll need to create it again on the 4G network. So you may go from IINet to Telstra. Now they don't like that. They want you to stay on their network all the time and get as much money from you as they possibly can. So that's what 5G is all about. Getting the Wi-Fi, the 5G, all of the different networks connected together so that your service, not the network, but your service is totally transparent to you. So you don't know whether you're working fixed or you're on a radio network. You might be on a radio network, it might be Wi-Fi, it might be 4G, it might be 3G. You don't really care as long as the service you're using at that point in time keeps operating. 
And that's what's going to happen in the future. So the question started out, I know it's a question for a very long way, so it started out saying, are we too late? No, it's never too late. Now, I'm still getting my back fixed, my legs fixed, my legs fixed. It's not too late, you can keep repairing. So the fibre will last for a very long time. The mixed technology, the current NBN build structure will need to be repaired, it will need to go to fibre. It's going to cost us a lot more money. Unfortunately, that's the politics. I'm not going to talk about the politics. Uh, my question just goes on to that. We work to try and support older people um, to start to use their devices because now they have to. And I've had a question from the retirement village up the road, what's going to happen, NBN's coming, what we're being told they have to get it. And I don't know the answer. I'm hoping you can tell me what I have to tell them. Uh, all I know is when we got NBN at our office in Penrith, that was by uh, three years and a half ago, and it didn't speed anything up. And the way I was explaining was that because we're a house, and we're, but we're really a business, um, it's not there's not enough bandwidth, one of those terms, that actually makes it work faster or something. But anyway, I don't even know where to start to tell them. I just know how to tell them how to text. And so if we'll go with a couple of hypotheses to be able to answer the question. So just say that they're going to get fibre into their particular retirement village. What that means is they'll turn off the copper network. So the copper network gets replaced with fibre. So what they need to do is to buy a service from somebody. NBN code doesn't provide services to people. It's wholesale land. All it is is transport. They just take packets. They carry packets. Is it now, telephone copper? I'm no. No. The fibre replaces everything. The telephone will work perfectly well on top of the fibre. The standard NBN code build has a battery backup. The battery backup lasts for four hours. Even when after that four hours, there's a button on there for an emergency telephone call. So for aged people that are worried about being able to make a phone call from a fixed line, if they really want to do that, most of them are mobile these days, but if they're really worried about that, they do have that button to use in case of a blackout. But they have to get a service from Telstra or IINET or Optus or Voter or somebody else. That's what they have to do. Now, they have to do that only if they want to use a computer or no, a device. No, they just have to do it anyway. They, they, the Telstra phone service will be trans... Will, yeah, they will get a form in the mail for their phone service and Telstra will plead, beg with them and everything to try and get their business carried across onto their service. So the very, very basic low-speed service has the phone capability in there. Now, your other question about why isn't it any faster, remember, NBN code just takes the packet from your house and puts it over here at that point of interconnect. Now, if the person you buy the service from picks up that package from the point of interconnect in a ute or a wheelbarrow and wanders down the street with it, then it's going to take a long time and be slow. If he picks it up with a high-speed service, it's going to be fast. So the service provider that provides the service has a hell of a lot to do with the actual transport. Now, unfortunately, the government decreed that NBNCO has 121 points of interconnect. So those drop-off points, there's 121 of them. So anybody that wants to offer a service in Australia has to go around and do that. When I designed it, I actually designed 10. Two in Sydney, two in Melbourne, two in Brisbane, two in Adelaide, two in Perth. That's it. So anybody can get their package from there. Much better, anyway, that's my problem. <laughs> Did that answer your question? One quick question, and then a more difficult question. Quick question, what percentage of Australian premises are actually connected to copper? To copper itself? Yeah. There, were, there was a, 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 a varied, because there's universal service obligation that Telstra had for a long time, so it's 89% have a copper connection. Okay. And the other question is, I live at the end of a dead end street and there's some 60 houses up the road from me. I'm expecting fibre to the curb. I'm working on the theory that if I pay for fibre to the premises, my packets are going to go down the line faster because I've got optic the whole way, from house all the way, but everybody else that's relying on the copper from the um, curb to the house. Is that true? Both yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
Yes. <laughs> so the, the, the thing with fibre to the curve, fibre to the curve is using a technology called GFAST. GFAST is a next step on from VDSL, which is very high speed digital subscriber line, which is the next step on from ADSL, which is asymmetrical digital subscriber line. So these are new technologies to make copper work faster over very short distances. Now, the issue is that the, the you want to buy fibre to your house, and there's a capability on the NBN Co's website to let you do that, but where they'll get you, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Remember I said I put in 432 fibre cables and 288, that was my design. They've replaced those with architecture for multi-technology mix. So where I put in a 432 fibre cable, they're putting in a 72 fibre cable. Oh. And where I put in a 288 fibre cable, they're putting in 12. Oh. So there's no fibres going back to the fan side. Yeah. So you might think that, hang on, I just want to use one of those spare fibres that that Ferris guy said there's going to be heaps of in the street. <laughs> and it's really easy because they just run a little one of those tiny little twin fibres that said just from the house, but because um, it's not there. <laughs> They didn't put it in. Six hundred dollars. You have to pay them six hundred dollars just for a quote. To give a quote, yes. but the quote you consumed that the one guy was somewhere on one hundred and forty-four thousand dollars yep. to put the fiber in. Because they they have what's that? Can't say that. Yeah. <laughs> they, the, the, there's no spare fiber. The design is yep. So the product of the yes. that you're asking for isn't from the, the curve. It's, it's from, from the, the fan side. It's from the fan side. Yes. From the cable all the way back to the... That's, that's, that's where they get you coming or going. Now, I could roll a fiber under the house. I'll roll so the damn thing under the Why do they want you to wait until you've got fiber to the curve before you can apply for fiber to the curve? So they can tell you that they haven't got enough fiber in the street. Because yeah. otherwise you'd say, when you put that damn cable in, put an yes. extra fiber in, it'll cost me three cents. Yes. And they won't do that. I emailed them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. If you if you if the network was designed to be upgraded, it would be dead simple and cheap, but it hasn't been designed. It's it's, it's just, that's what it is, sorry. Okay, one here and then in the back. Yep. Um, we buy get the NBN say marked to the premise and and that glass pipe comes into my house, obviously it's sort of thing that goes past but on other people's houses, and they must share that same driver. Now, I buy a packet, say, from company A, and it's, and it's mid speed. What throttles what I get in my house to the guy next door that's sharing the same fiber that might get a higher speed or a lower speed? What throttles what I get? Okay, and so does it throttle him? Yep. So the, the design for the, the passive optical network that was, was used, called it's called GPON, which is the gigabit passive optical network, is a, you share that fiber with 32 others. So it's a one to 32 split that happens in that cabinet. That fiber distribution hub is in the design where the splitters are. So in that particular hub, the light that comes from the fan side is split 32 ways. So that's 1.25 gigabits a second constant rate. So that's what it is. So you're sharing that 1.25 gig with 32 other people. Now the, the throttling you speak about in the prioritization of the packets happens back in the point of interconnect where the NBN code delivers the packets to the different people. There's no throttling whatsoever in the NBN code's network. This NBN Co doesn't prioritize packets anything other than voice and the seven tiers that are possible, but all data is on tier four. So data is tier four, voice is tier three. So it's it's all made that throughput. Now you might think, hang on, 32 into 1.25 gig, that doesn't give me a hundred doesn't doesn't give me a one gigabit service. But the the characteristics of the data that you utilize means that you can very easily work a 100 megabit 
service delivering to you, and even a one gigabit interface delivering to you across that particular connection. Because you cannot send data constantly at that same 1.25 gig rate from anything you're going to have in your house. Even Blade servers are pushing it to have a constant bit rate at that level. And the protocols you worked with to download and to work at and virtual reality machines, anything that we can currently imagine will, will not do that. But even if it did, even if you're running a business and said, I've got a, an MRI imager and a CAT scan imager and I want real-time high bandwidth, in the cabinet, NBNCO can just change that split ratio. They can just take ports off it or bypass the splitter altogether for a business-grade service. So the network's designed for it. What you're now describing are the services that run on top of that network and how we configure those services. Now, the original network was a utility. So it was designed to handle lots and lots of different services. What's being delivered now is a multi-technology mix which gives 25 megabit high-span broadband to all Australians. <laughs> themselves, those containers, not the fiber distribution hubs themselves. I'm still confused how the system works because it was easy with the whole system where a pair of cable that went from your house to the exchange. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, uh, I think the original system was to make one fiber from your house to the exchange or not. Now, it was one fiber from the, from the hat from your house. So I'll just go back to this, this particular picture. So one fiber from your house went into the network access point. In the fiber distribution hub, which is one of these dots, that's where it, the, that fiber was joined with 31 others through a splitter. And then one fiber from there goes all the way back to the fan site. So this particular box is a fan out box where it went from 1 to 32. Now, if, if all of the network came back to the actual fan site, then you'd need 38,400 fibers all the way back. And the space to actually put the connection frame was too big to fit in the exchange. So with the Telstra deal, we, well, NBNCO, I've got to stop saying we, NBNCO got 16,000 rack spaces in 1,000 exchanges to put equipment. That's rented. Again, that's part of the deal. So they, that's where the electronics goes in the fan site, and the other part of the electronics is actually in your house. So technically, when in, in, in the box outside, it goes from 32 to 1. 
he still passes the Mr. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I said. It's all done with mirrors. It's a, there's a, a grating, an optical grating, where the light comes in and it goes through a very narrow, like a, you've seen a prism where the colours of light are split out in a prism? That same sort of principle. So, so what's the difference between one signal and the other? The difference in the signals is in the actual coding. So the, the same signal goes to every single house of those 32 because it's a power splitter. So the power is divided by 32. That's what limits the range to about 20k range from the fan side to the house. And the electronics you have in your house picks your particular enabled signal out of that 1.25 gigabit bit stream. So each client has got a different coding of our system. It's all coding that is one number. Basically. That's correct. That's Thank you very much. Thank you. I've just got a question from an audience member who wanted to know, can you choose not to have the NVN? Can you exist without, with your mobile, for example? You, of course you can. You can elect not to have NVN connected to your premises. Uh, the copper that you had now will be turned off. So you can work on a fixed radio network if that's all you want to do. There is no issue whatsoever about not having NBNCO or not having a broadband service on a fixed network in your premises. Um, yeah, uh, I've got uh, fiber to the node. When I first got it connected, it was fantastic. It was so much better than previous. Now it's back to um, current and slower than the previous CMS I had. Um, uh, as I understand it, there are two things in fiber to the node. One is your distance from the box in your street, mine's across the road from me. And the other is your provider, your provider will, will uh, buy a certain number of, of uh, <coughs> a certain amount of bandwidth for, for, for an area. And if, if you've got 100 people using that bandwidth, then that's fine. But maybe if they get 200 people, then they've got problems. Um, so, but what I'd like to know is, is, I, is uh, they have decided in some areas to replace fiber to the node with fiber to the, to the curb, but only for certain people. And uh, is there any chance this is going to come to the Blue Mountains or, uh, or anything like that? Again, I, I can't talk about the current planning regime for for NBN Co. The the will the. The rollout of fibre to the node has been slowed down and replaced. So if you have fibre to the node, that's what you got. Sorry, that's it. End of story. Fibre to the curb will be a replacement for fibre to the node. You mentioned different things there. The, the issue with fibre to the node as well is fibre to the node has a DSLAN, the digital subscriber access line multiplexes, in that particular box. So depending on the number of customers they're serving in the copper cables that are leaving that, that will also affect your speed. Now they use a VDSL protocol, a very high speed digital subscriber line protocol. They've had to wind that right back down so it doesn't interfere until they've finished cutting over everybody and then they can wind it up a bit. So the, the issue with the fibre to the node is those active electronics in that box and the interference you get in the cables around that box and also the existing services from the exchange. And they all interfere with each other until the 18 months after cutover, when everything's cut over, then it might get a bit faster. So, so that's, that's the situation with the technology of fibre to the node. Hello. Um, you showed the graph with uh, we suddenly started rising uh, significantly. Now, when without being political, but the excuse for going for fibre to the what to multi technology mix was that the uh, 29 billion was going to blow out to 90 or 100 or 130 billion. Could you just? Give us some idea of how truthful that <laughs> was in the statement and um, any other information about that because it looks logical that if we're going to blow it out, then just knock it back to 80% and then the last 20% using MTN. Oh. The, the, the way I see it is 
for you? There's a, there's a, there's a much, there's a, there's a, a very, very good explanation of the, the costings and the fibre, written by um, Mike Quigley, who was the CEO of MBN Co. Mike was also a mathematician. He was the, the chairman of, of Alcatel, the CEO of Alcatel Lucent. He, he is much, much better at the financials and the figures than I will ever be. So go on the website and get his full report, and that'll tell you about it. There is no structural justification whatsoever from the figures stated of that $90 billion. None whatsoever. Zero. Nilch. Nada. Not happening. The, the figures that were in the strategic review, which was done by the Boston Consultancy Group, are a far better reference. They were the figures that were used in those two curves that I put up there. And again, go on the internet. That analysis was done by a uh, a, a modelling and financial analyst from a um, um, university in Melbourne. So again, that set of resources can give you a much better description than I can. There was never any fundamental factual basis for those figures that were stated in the political arena. Yeah, there's a question here. And we've probably just got time for one more after this lady. should be on. Just in reference to your previous answer, not the one you've just given, I'm in the Mid Mountains again with Fiverrton and Renaud, and my telephone line keeps dropping out. Does your previous answer explain why my telephone line, which obviously used to be on the copper wire, continually drops out? Well, your telephone now, line now is on the copper that goes to that node. The, the copper Again, it's, it's a very old copper, especially up here in the mountains. We've got some of the oldest copper infrastructure around. And you know, there are many, many reasons for it to drop out. The, the configuration you have with fibre to the node is less reliable. And then on top of that, you've got a service provider that is providing a, an IP-derived voice service on top of your broadband connection. And they can have issues as well. So it may be a combination of those things to do it. So the, 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 your first point of call is your service provider that's providing that voice line. They should be able to test it and determine if it's anything in their equipment and then refer you back to NBN Co. But I mean, the, the issue is you're utilizing very old copper infrastructure in a, a poorly designed um, clutch to get it to work cheaply. But it's not cheap. Okay, last question, I think. Where and how do the packets leaving my house join the rest of the big white internet world and go off and make requests in Germany and Scandinavia and the like? They, they join the rest of the world in a place called an IPX, which is an internet exchange. So the retail service provider that picks up that packet from the point of interconnected NBN Co has to take it back to their data center. And in their data center, their board capacity to go to the internet exchange, the IPX, the cross-connect point. And that's where the various carriers that form the worldwide web or the mesh of connectivity that makes the internet, that's where they connect together. So the routers that exist in the IPX handle the packets that go all over the world. So there are things called DNS servers, domain name servers that exist in a variety of places. Your carrier will have one, Google's got one, different people have one. That gives the address of the packet. So when you type in a name, it goes and gets the IP address, puts it on that packet and sends it into those routers. So the connectivity from your internet service provider, your RF retail service provider, to the various IPX points of interconnect also affects the speed of how your data is going to travel. So it's, it's those elements in the mesh. Remember, NBN can just picks up the packet from your house and drops it off at those 121 points. And then they step back and say, that's it, done my job. Well, speaking of done my job, uh, thank you very much, Peter. You're